From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Coming up today, over from the Farm Service Agency, Chuck Pettijohn will cover an assortment of USDA program items, among those the latest on CFAP and WIP payments, and the deadlines on reporting crop acres and prevented plantings information. Also today, our latest Kansas wheat harvest update, and this time featuring Extension Agricultural Agent Ron Honig of the Wild West Extension District that covers Haskell, Seward, and Stevens counties in southwest Kansas. And further ahead on this week's wildlife management segment, K-State's Charlie Lee will report this time on new research of barn owls as an alternative means of rodent control. All that and more right here on Agriculture Today. Thanks once more for being along with us for Agriculture Today. We'll open with the latest edition of FSA Coffee Talk, where every other Tuesday we bring by folks from the state headquarters of the Farm Service Agency to bring you fully in the know on the latest concerning USDA programs of interest to you. Happens that the acting state director of the FSA in Kansas, Chuck Pettijohn, has agreed to join us one more time. Good to have you here, Chuck. And Thanks for having us. You bet. One of the things that you wanted to get right into was where your local FSA centers, USDA service centers, stand as far as being open for business. Again, working the way out of the pandemic. What's the latest on that? Well, we're still um, not at 100% capacity with staffing in our local service centers as far as COVID is concerned. And with that, uh, we're taking customers by appointment. And doing that, then that gives us the opportunity to limit Uh, how many we have in the facility at one time. We do ask that uh, anybody that has not been vaccinated uh, wear a a face covering, a mask when they come in. And so we're having to honor the 75% staffing level. Still at those levels, we got most of our employees working from home and um, getting one step closer to being fully open. So the best thing yet to do is simply contact through phone, via email, whatever it might be, your local FSA personnel and uh, line up appointments as necessary. Absolutely. Yep. Work with the local folks and um, we'll do our best to get you service. In a moment, we'll get into some uh, particular USDA program details, but you wanted to take time here to remind folks, Chuck, about the role of the state FSA committee, and there are turnovers coming on that committee. Yeah, with our structure within Farm Service Agency, we do have a state committee that is producers throughout the state that are appointed by the secretary to serve on the state committee. The committee that's been serving under the Republican administration have served for four years, uh, and last Friday was their uh, last day to serve their their four-year term. From the Winfield area, uh, Lexi Goyer was our, served as our most recent uh, chairperson of the state committee. She'll be going off. Uh, Greg McCurry from the Sedgwick area, Mike Jordan from Bloyd, Nick Gutterman from Bucyrus, and then uh, Garrett Love from Montezuma. We certainly do appreciate their time and working with this group of fine individuals. They've done an excellent job making certain that the concerns of the producers within Kansas are covered and just a just a real good group of people. So I, I find it an honor to work with them. And saluting those people for their service to farmers through the FSA State Committee. New members will be appointed soon, you say, as well as the state executive director, you think? Well, I certainly hope so. (laughs) That would get me back to doing my duties in southeast Kansas as district director. But kind of the word that we've been given is it's it's the first step in in getting the new state committee in place and then the state executive director. So the state executive directors come as an appointment from the White House and the state committee uh, appointment through the secretary. And so we do anticipate those to come out real soon. We'll look for the news as it comes forth. Speaking of committees, an important date coming up for the county FSA committees. Elections will be later on and nominations are due relatively soon, you say. 
Yeah, on the county committee level, uh, we have anywhere from three to five members that serve within the county that's on the county committee. They're producers that actively have farming interest within the county, and those uh, are broke into what we call local administrative areas. And each of those rotate through elections, so there will be at least one and possibly two local administrative areas that a candidate will be up for either election or have served their term. And so we'll take nominations of anybody within that local administrative area up until August the 2nd is the final day to accept those nominations. So you might want to check with your local office. We keep a a map in front of every office as to who those folks are or what the area, local administrative area is. The other thing um, that we want to make sure that we cover is you know, think of our special interest groups, uh, our socially disadvantaged and the like, to make sure that we're getting representation from all aspects. So uh, keep that in mind when making those um, nominations for election. And any producer can qualify, by and large. That right? is correct. you got to live within the right. county or live within that local administrative area. There are a little few caveats to that where at least primarily the the bulk of your farming operation has to fall into that local administrative area. Again, the deadline for nominations, August the 2nd. Note that for county FSA committee nominees. Beyond the administrative material there, we'll talk about some programs briefly here, Chuck. The WIP Plus program payments are going out now? Yeah, we've issued, I'm going to say a handful of them. They are pushed down through us electronically from our national office processing site. And then the county offices, we have to, what we call, sign those and and issue those at a local level, which, again, is an electronic push. We've got uh, a fair amount of them on the WIP Plus uh, and QLA payments, so there will be more waves of them, if you will, going out over the next couple weeks. I know we've had some calls from producers that say, hey, I, I got some payment, but I don't think it's all of it. And that very well might be. I guess be patient with us. We'll get those out here over the next couple of weeks, be making those waves of payments, and they'll be coming out. And those, once more, to remind our disaster loss payments. That is correct. Uh, WIP Plus is a wildfire hurricane incentive, which we kind of think, gosh, we're, we don't really have a lot of hurricanes around here, but it was under that funding package that they've continued to do those uh, disaster programs. And under the quality program, uh, the bulk of our payments under the quality loss come out of the cotton counties. That's where we're seeing the bulk of those payments issued. But it's all under the funding under the WIP program. Kind of a limited set of money there, so we had to wait and get all the applications in around the United States uh, before they could make the distribution if they needed to um, allocate that money accordingly that they didn't have enough funds to go around. All right. You've CFAP news for us, you say, Jeff? Yeah, a couple things on the coronavirus food assistance. We've had two rounds of CFAP payments, and they're talking about another CFAP program, which they are working on the provisions of that uh, right now that was part of this um, last uh, American Rescue Plan. And so at the field level, uh, we don't have the details on that, but we do anticipate Um, some involvement in that. We're probably not going to see the type of payments and the volume under this program in Kansas that we've seen under the prior two programs that we have had. So um, as far as CFAP2, we still are waiting for word on contract growers and hog operations yet with regards to those payments. I know we got some producers that's been waiting for that, and so they're still uh, working on some provisions with, with regard to certain programs under CFAP2. So we haven't finalized that, and we do anticipate and will be putting out uh, more as we move forward on CFAP3. So stay tuned. Be sure and and go to our websites and, and look for information there on our public sites uh, for those programs. Local counties will be pushing out information as well. So more to come on that as we get it. Very well. Well, a few quick hitters here and dates of 
consequence for producers to keep in mind. Producers need to get those acreages reported for a current cropping year. Yeah, absolutely. All of our programs tie back to an acreage report of all land uses. When I say all land uses, that includes grazing. Um, I know that uh, from year to year, people kind of forget to report their grass acres to us, and all of those acreage reports need to be filed by July 15th. Most all of our programs, there's a tie to eligibility. So when we think of our crops, those need to be reported. Those are the same dates that crop insurance utilizes, and we can share that data with the RMA uh, both ways to keep away from late filing fees. But the key is you got to get in and report those acreages by uh, July 15th. And aligned with that to a certain extent, the prevented planting numbers, if producers have been pushed in that direction by the weather, that reporting is due as well. Absolutely. Prevent plant, you need to report that to our office within 15 days of the final plant date for that crop. Uh, Again, if you have crop insurance, uh, we will reciprocate with crop insurance to accept that as timely filed. We just like for producers to make it a habit of, of letting us know that way we have it on record, meet that deadline, and save a whole lot of headaches for everybody. So inquire about that or any of the other FSA business matters that we've discussed today through your local FSA office. Even if the doors aren't fully open yet, they are, in fact, open for business. Contact the good folks there. And, Chuck, thanks for giving us an overview of all of this. Appreciate it. You bet. Thank you. He's the acting director of the Farm Service Agency here in Kansas, Chuck Pettijohn with the latest FSA Coffee Talk for you here on Agriculture Today. Agriculture Today continues now on the K-State Radio Network and time once more for more word on wheat harvest progress in Kansas. And this time it'll be from the farther southwestern part of the state where the Wild West District is set up in three counties in the southwest. The Extension Agricultural Agent there is Ron Honig. And Ron, we're talking about a pretty good swath of area that you covered down there. Tell us when you got started with wheat cutting, if you would. Well, generally, our wheat harvest began down here, oh, about Friday, June 18th. And that's down here in the Wild West District. So that would be the counties of Stevens, Haskell, and Seward, way down here in the southwest uh, corner of Kansas. We've been running, you know, for a little over a week now. And the weather has been conducive to that? Well, we started out with good, you know, uh, kind of hot, dry, windy weather. And that really made that, that dry land wheat mature and, and ripen along really well. And the guys were able to get in and, and keep going. And then we had some scattered showers that moved in later in the week. And then we had some, some storms through the southern part of the district that slowed harvest down. So, so since then now, uh, you know, harvest has been a little bit spotty. And we've had scattered evening showers. And then, oh, higher than usual humidity and some muddy conditions in those uh, southern areas of the district. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of slowed the harvest down at the moment. That paradox, rain is always welcome in southwest Kansas, though, normally. Right, yeah, we hate to turn it away, and, and we're certainly uh, needing it for the you know the dry land milo and dry land corn, and, and even the irrigated corn needed a break. It needed some extra rain, so, so we're happy to, to have the rains. You say that the crop has done well in those three counties, uh, largely because moisture has been adequate to sustain it. Right. If you take a look back at the kind of our winter weather, we had some, some nice wet snows that came in kind of late in the winter. And then in March, we had a good two-inch rain across most of the uh, southwest area. So that really promoted good wheat growth, got the wheat rolling along and, and I think promoting test weights. April was, was dry out here, but then we had rains that came in again in May, and that kind of capped off uh, what appears to be a better better than average dry land wheat crop uh, across this area. However, there were areas where droughty conditions have taken a pretty hard toll, haven't they? 
Yeah, as you look at the, the western edge of our district and counties on the southwestern tier of Kansas, those are were much drier going through the winter, and we saw some significant drought stress throughout that kind of stream, southwest area of Kansas, uh, southeastern Colorado, and that western Oklahoma panhandle. All those areas were much drier coming through the winter, and we're showing a lot more stress than our rest of our eastern area of our district. So we did see some yield reductions in scattered fields. And I'm saying west of Huguton on across Morton County. You can kind of draw that line wherever you'd like, but I kind of use Huguton as that edge. And if you go west to the Colorado border, that's where we saw probably the most uh, drought stress in fields across that area. Well, then, how far along are your producers in their cutting? Are they getting relatively close to complete? What? Well, currently, as far as dry land harvest, and dry land is going to be the, the bulk of our, our wheat acres out this way, producers are estimating probably 80 to 90 percent complete on the dry land acres. Irrigated acres, they've got started into them, but they're saying probably approximately 10 percent harvested of the irrigated. Generally, the irrigated wheat's going to be wetter and it takes a little longer to dry it down. So now we're kind of at that spot. We're waiting on that, that irrigated wheat to dry down. Well, then, of the wheat that has been brought in, what are you seeing in the way of yields, test weights, so forth? Well, uh, dry land yields generally very good, with the exception of that western edge of that district that, that had that drop stress. So dry land wheat yields are generally being reported from 40 to 70 bushel an acre and having test weights of 59 to 63 pounds a bushel. And we have had some, some samples that came in, and these, these would be individual truckloads with test weights as high as 64 and a half or even higher. But again, those are individual samples, and those are not, not field averages. But still, those are impressive and, numbers. Yeah, that's, that's good. Now, in that drier region uh, out west, some of those yields out there, we're looking more at the 20 to 25 bushel acre ranges mm-hmm. is what we've had reports so far. Irrigated yields, they've been reported in the 65 to 90 bushel range uh, at this time. We just have limited acres at this time that have been harvested of the irrigated wheat. But again, test weights uh, on the irrigated wheat for the samples that have come in have been generally 60 pounds and over, so generally good. Did you fight disease in Haskell, in Stevens, in Seward counties? Yeah, really across the, the whole uh, the southwestern area, we had significant stripe rust pressure earlier in the season. So we had many of our producers were using fungicides in their management programs. So fields that had stripe rust but didn't have uh, natural resistance in the varieties and went untreated, the scouts are reporting they saw some significant foliage damage on those fields and, and undoubtedly you know, yield reductions on those, those fields as well. And we've also had reports of head scab that came in uh, fairly late in the season. And unfortunately, it came in on some fields that late enough that the fungicide had not been used. It was too late to apply a fungicide. So we have seen a little bit of head scab that has come in late in the season. Once more, head scab or fusarium head blight's a, something of a rarity in your area, isn't it, Ron? We see a, a here and there, and usually it's somewhat tied to varieties, but uh, we'll see it every once in a while uh, in certain areas So when conditions are right. But, but generally, we've gone uh, you know, a number of years where we don't see anything of, of a general problem uh, across the area, more spotty, you know, tied to uh, the certain varieties. Well, with field conditions as they are as we speak, are your producers with wheat yet left to cut on the sidelines for a short time here? Yeah, right at the moment, producers are kind of picking around, trying to find fields that are dry enough to, to go and, and hoping the conditions will, will dry off a little bit. We're still kind of damp and, and humid right at the moment, so that's slowing guys down, and they're kind of waiting to get in and get into that better wheat. Some producers have said, you know, some of their best wheat's yet to be cut, so we're waiting to get in there and see how that, that produces. Yeah, so things are slowed down right at the, at the moment, just kind of waiting on the, the weather to dry off a little bit. We've had a lot of cloud cover, and and still a little bit humid out this way. All in all, though, as you've visited with your growers, this has been a relatively good to better than good wheat year for them, a profitable venture for a lot of folks out there. But the the attitude has to be fairly upbeat. Yeah, it's nice to you know it's nice to see a, a lot of bushels coming in, and it's nice to to have a a good price, certainly a better price than we've seen in years past. So 
so yeah, I think attitudes are good among the producers, and they're happy to get those bushels in the band and you know move on to the next thing. So yeah, I think we're we're looking very good across this area for the most part in terms of of a good good wheat year down here. And let's hope with the moisture that's come through, following up then with a good row crop year likewise in your dryland areas. We need to get the wheat cut out and let the let the rains come. Ron, we appreciate the overview, the comments. Thanks, and take care down that way. Okay, Eric, thank you. Ron Honig with us, the Extension Agricultural Agent in the Wild West Extension District in southwest Kansas that's comprised of Haskell, Seward, and Stevens Counties. With that word on harvest progress and results to date in that district. Adding another harvest note here from the daily report out of Kansas Wheat. The grain merchandiser with Scott Cooperative in Scott City, Brindley McNary, was reporting that that co-op has taken in more than a million bushels so far. The first significant day of harvest this past Sunday, yields ranging from 60 to 80 bushels per acre, which is pretty close to the average, she says. Protein from 10 to 13 and a half percent. Test weights have all been good, she reports, above 60 pounds, and moisture about 12 and a half percent. Some dockage. A slight issue in the southern part of Scott County, but Brindley's saying that harvest will continue in that county for another 10 days or so. And just to add ahead of the break, what the USDA has to say about winter wheat conditions and harvest progress in its weekly report for Kansas. The condition of the state's winter wheat crop, 62% good to excellent as of this past Sunday, 25% fair, 13% poor to very poor, with wheat reaching maturity now at 83%, and the harvest, 41% complete, says the USDA. That is slightly behind the 48% average for the date. Meanwhile, on the national scale, the winter wheat harvest continued to accelerate last week advancing 16% during the week, reaching 33% completion as of Sunday. That's still behind the average of 40% for the date. In addition to Kansas, 41% harvested. Oklahoma is now 80% done. The winter wheat condition nationally, for that still left in the field, 48%, good to excellent. And just to note the USDA's latest report on spring wheat conditions, deteriorating again. Down another 7% last week, only 27% good to excellent as of last Sunday. That remains the lowest rating for the spring wheat crop since 1988. We'll share the rest of that Kansas crop progress and condition report after the break. Also standing by with that weekly segment for you dairy producers, K-State's Mike Brook with Milk Lines. And further ahead, this week's wildlife management segment with K-State's Charlie Lee. All of that is still to come here on the K-State Radio Network. This is Agriculture Today. Coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Welcome back. Eric Atkinson here, and on we go now to today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. And picking back up on that Kansas crop progress and condition report out from the USDA, for the week ending this past Sunday, our topsoil moisture in the state was 5% surplus, 71% adequate, 24% short to very short, subsoil moisture, 3% surplus, 76% adequate, and 21% Uh, short to very short. Again, the winter wheat harvest, 41% complete, as was reported earlier. Corn crop condition in the state, 69% good to excellent this week, 25% fair, 6% poor to very poor. Corn now silking at 8%. The average for the date is 13%. Soybean crop condition, 64% good to excellent, 30% fair, 6% poor to very poor, with soybean emergence, 86%. Blooming at 15% now, that's ahead of the 6% average for the date. As for the grain sorghum crop then, 73% good to excellent, 23% fair, 4% poor to very poor. Range and pasture conditions in the state this week, 61% good to excellent, 31% fair, and 8% poor to very poor. 
Well, condition ratings for the country's two main crops are down, according to the USDA, but they appear to be stabilizing. Here's more from the USDA's Stephanie Ho. The latest condition outlook for the country's main crops is not good. This includes a net overall decline in corn condition ratings. Generally speaking, crop conditions have stabilized as we did see rains moving into the heart of the Midwest. Nationally, 64 percent of the U.S. corn rated good to excellent. It's down a point from last week. 8% very poor to poor, and that is a two-point increase from June 20th. That was USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey. Last year at this time, we had a much better overall corn crop that was 73% good to excellent, 5% very poor to poor. Meanwhile, he notes that soybean conditions also appear to have stabilized. Just like last week, 60% rated good to excellent, 9% very poor to poor, but that places this year's crop well below what we were seeing this time a year ago when we were at 71 percent good to excellent and just five percent very poor to poor. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Also in the headlines today, the Supreme Court will not hear a challenge to California's Proposition 12, which was filed by the North American Meat Institute. It requires hog producers to abide by certain regulations to sell pork in California come next January the 1st and beyond. NAMI filed that petition for a writ of certiorari with the Supreme Court in February, asking the court to review an earlier ruling, which upheld the law by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. This law requires hog producers to abide by regulations to sell pork in California. Voters in the state passed that proposition back in 2018 with nearly 63 percent of the votes supporting it. California consumers are likely to experience sticker shock when shopping for pork after January the 1st when Proposition 12 takes effect. A new white paper released by the Food Equity Alliance last week said an expected 50 percent reduction in pork exported to California will create supply shortages and raise pork prices for consumers. Now, NAMI had opposed the law because the group said it would increase costs for producers and consumers. In March, the Institute was joined in its case by 20 states. Those included Kansas, Oklahoma, Missouri, and Nebraska. Coming your way next on Agriculture Today, this week's edition of Milk Lines. Here's K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook. Mike? Today I'd like to speak with our Kansas dairy producers concerning fly control around your dairy calves. As we look at summertime fly control, one of the primary areas we really need to look at is our baby calves. You know, there's a lot of things around a baby calf that really attracts a lot of flies. One is bedding. Second thing are the feeds that we generally feed there, milk, and then generally a starter feed that contains some molasses. So we have a lot of things that actually attract flies to that area of the dairy farm. So what are some things that you maybe should consider as you look at fly control in that area? Well, number one, the bedding. You know, a lot of times we have some serious fly breeding grounds that we create right around the calves. One of the primary places would be underneath or below the feed buckets where we feed water and milk. See, a lot of times those areas, the bedding gets wet. And, of course, if we have moisture there, that's an excellent place for flies to grow. So you might have to alternate some of your cleaning procedures on your dairy to do a good job of controlling that breeding ground. That material probably needs to be removed each week, and maybe the rest of the bedding maybe once every two weeks. But any area that gets wet should be removed at least on a weekly basis. This will reduce the chances that we will have a fly breeding ground that develops right there next to the calves. Second thing to take a look at, you know, just the amount of spilled milk around this area. If you can somehow reduce that, you reduce the chances of it's attracting the flies. Some other things to think about are the grass and weeds that might grow very close to the calf hutches or the calf rearing area. You need to make sure that you keep those areas mowed down as close as possible during the summertime. Now, once you've done all these things, what are some other things that we should do? Well, number one, probably need to include some insecticide control on a regular basis to try to control the fly population as much. Another aid to this would be fly traps. These can be especially effective in controlling house flies and certain other types of flies. 
Lastly, you need to just keep it up all summer. We know that fly populations tend to explode as we get deeper and deeper into the summer months. And this is just simply because we've had a buildup of the amount of fly eggs larvae that we have around and they continue to hatch on a regular basis. So we need to make sure that we do try to keep ahead as much as we can. Why do you need to do this? Well, in my mind, there's really two main reasons, maybe a third. Number one would be to help control the spread of pink eye. Flies do spread that fairly easily and within our calves that should be a major concern. Secondly, fly populations can spread mastitis. You know, even things like Staph aureus can be spread to the calf at a very young age and no, you won't see it until maybe they freshen, but you'll see it then. So trying to control fly populations around the calves is very, very important in reducing the mastitis that we might see in first lactation animals. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging our dairy farmers to be diligent about fly control around the calf area this summer. Thanks, Mike. This is Agriculture Today. Coming your way now on Agriculture Today, this week's wildlife management segment, as always. Former wildlife specialist Charlie Lee, K-State Research and Extension, is along with us for this. There is escalating interest, you say, Charlie, in the use of barn owls as a means of rodent control and a research project that looked into this. This is not exactly a new idea, but it's uh, regaining some steam. No, it's certainly not a new idea. Uh, From the late 19th century to in the 1930s, there were hundreds of studies that were published on the role of birds in agriculture. However, uh, by the late 1930s, articles depicting birds as useful agents of pest control had declined and the field of economic ornithology had all but disappeared. There are some reasons now to bring economics and ornithology or, or the use of birds to control agricultural pests back. We know that particularly in high value crops that perhaps don't encompass as many acres as things like corn and wheat and soybeans, vineyards, wine grape vineyards uh, or a location that's had problems with pests for many years. And one of their challenges is pocket gophers and voles. Both of those species are important pests. They are capable of injuring the roots of plants. They gnaw the bark. They girdle the vines several inches below the soil line, and they often can chew or gnaw through drip irrigation systems and cause a soil disturbance that some operators find uh, unattractive, if you will. So controlling those small mammal pests is a challenge for wine grape vineyard owners. And they've found over the years that trapping to control rodents is labor intensive. It's expensive due to the high initial costs of purchasing traps. And unless they're really dedicated, they soon lose interest and realize that unless they stay with it, they're not going to be successful. Chemical rodenticides can be very effective, but they also have high costs and there are some rodents that are becoming resistant to some compounds and secondary hazards to non-target wildlife species is certainly making the the media and the public at large be aware of companies that are using rodenticides as a means of control. So vineyard managers are, are looking for alternative forms and one of those that might be a possibility is the use of barn owls. And what is the appeal of the barn owl specifically as a uh, bird for rodent control? Well, they they have a lot of uh, useful characteristics. One is that they are almost entirely rodent consumers. They utilize uh, nest boxes quite readily. The nest boxes are inexpensive to install and maintain. The adults are not particularly very territorial and sometimes can reach high densities in a location. They're very efficient hunters, and their broods demand a lot of prey. And 
I think the most important thing is that their use has been shown in other countries to be fairly effective in reducing damage. In some of the Southeast Asian countries, they've reduced damage, uh, crop damage from species like black rats from 19% to down to 2% in Israel. They've been shown to greatly reduce damage in other types of crops in Kenya. They reduced damage from 22% to 6% in uh, maize fields. So other countries have shown some success on the small scale of using barn owls. However, there's very little research data that supports their use uh, here in the United States. Up until recently, you say, this research initiative attempted to track barn owls and whether they, in fact, tend to hunt rodents in, in this case, vineyard regions? Yes, this was a study done in the Napa Valley uh, where they've uh, taken on the, a multi-year research effort to utilize barn owls as a means of pest control. They captured 24 female barn owls, fitted them with GPS units so that they could monitor their locations. And then through the 2016 breeding season, which is March through August, they kept track of where the barn owls had visited. There are other parts of the study that have yet to come out, including some video of what prey items are being brought back to the nest. But this particular research section determined where the birds were hunting. And what did they find in the way of hunting patterns and tendencies there? Well, they had over 95 100 GPS telemetry locations. They found that 26% of the time they were in grassland habitat, 26% of the time within vineyards, 25% of the time in an oak savanna habitat, 12% in a riparian habitat, and then the remaining 11% of the time that was spread between urban, mixed forest, and water or wetland environments. We do know that within that area, 50% of the habitat was with vineyards, but they were only hunting within them less than 30% of the time. We know that 25% of the habitat in that area was grassland, and they hunted that about 25% of the time. 6% was water and wetlands, and 3% urban. Again, very similar to what percentage that they hunted. The surprising thing was that they're not hunting the vineyard in equal percentages as the habitat occupies. And those locations where they're spending most of their time are the uncultivated habitats nearby. And there is certainly a lot of research that would support that those type habitats probably have a higher percentage of rodents. We have a higher biodiversity there, different vegetative types. That's the type of habitats the small rodents do well in. Well, the takeaway then, Charlie, would seem to be that Barn owls as a, a way of controlling rodent issues, well, they have some value, but they are going to be more augmenting other methods as well as opposed to substituting for them. Yeah, I, I think this uh, continues to show what we've talked about many times, that an integrated pest management solution is best. Interesting work that's been completed recently on barn owl hunting of rodents. Charlie, thanks. Longtime K-State Wildlife Specialist Charlie Lee with us, and that's our time for today. We appreciate you tuning in. Eric Atkinson here for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.